Hi, in this particular video we're going to have a look briefly at a process known as test-driven development. It's quite an interesting way of using testing to lead the, the design and the development of, of, of your particular project and it's certainly one you, you might want to sort of consider as, as being worthwhile adopting. So I suppose the, the first thing to say by way of introducing this here is that the name is ever so slightly misleading in the sense you might sort of view this as just another testing approach and it is in some sense but very much test-driven development is a design philosophy it's a way of using testing as as a driver as the thing that helps shape and progress how our design and higher implementation actually involves so so it's important then not just simply to think of this as simply as a testing approach is much more um, than that. Uh, in essence, you, you by testing first, you design your code. That's what we want to try to get out of it. Uh, advantage of it is it helps then the developers think about how something will be used uh, in terms of the things that it must do, in terms of the user acceptance tests that uh, are going to lend the users to saying, yes, this is exactly what we want. And to do that first and foremost, before they then start thinking about, well, how can we implement and provide that functionality. And if you think about it, that's the right way around things ought to be done. Uh, so test-driven development is based on short development iterations. It's an iterative process. We will go through the same set of three steps time and time again. And by repeating those steps, the software will, will emerge through the design, through the implementation. Uh, and we'll have a look at these things now. So there's actually three main laws associated with TDD. Uh, you can see them displayed here. The first one is you may not write production code until you have written a failing unit test. Otherwise stated that you start off with the unit test. Uh, so you define something that must be true or something you're purporting to be true in terms of capturing a piece of new functionality or, or some other desirable thing. That's your starting point and you do that before you've thought about the design, before you've written any code. And almost by definition, if you do that at that point, there's no functionality in place. This is for new functionality, so your unit test won't pass because the thing that you want to put in hasn't yet been put in. So that's when it says a failing unit test. You start off, you define a unit test that is going to fail because there's no implementation, no production code uh, to support that behind it. The second uh, law is that you may not write more of a unit test then is sufficient to fail and not compiling is failing. So the way to interpret this particular one is that instead of writing a grand unit test where you try to capture and bring together all of the functionality, you write the simplest possible unit test you can. So if you're introducing a new piece of functionality, you think, well, what is the most simple unit test I can have for this that captures uh, some pertinent element of it? And that's what you write. So simple unit test, not grand unit test. And the bit about not compiling is failing, again, sort of highlights that when we're thinking here of making things as simple as possible, then having a unit test that, that looks, uh, that, that it basically is in terms of the structures and the connections, not necessarily functionality, that also applies. The third law is that you may not write more code than is sufficient to pass the currently failing test. So given a failing unit test that you've introduced, you write sufficient code and nothing more than that to pass that test. And that's when you stop. So you don't go beyond your own extra stuff, just enough to pass the particular test. And that is one particular iteration. There is a refactoring element, we'll go into that in a second. But having done that, then we repeat the process. We come up with another simple unit test, simple as we can. We implement the functionality for that just until it's capable of passing. And we repeat the process. How this then ties together, that they have in, in TDD is known as a red-green refactor process. Uh, and, and this sort of helps illustrate then the iterative nature of this. And you can see it's presented here really as a circular process that we keep going around and around this particular uh, loop. Uh, the red phase, the starting phase, is that we introduce a test and it's a failing test. So red, make it fail, so no code uh, coding without a failing test. Green 
is where you say, right, if we have this failing test, let's introduce sufficient production code to get it passing. So we write enough code, enough functionality to pass the test. And the new element here uh, is the refactoring bit, the blue phase of this, that once we have passed the test, we have a look at what we've done. And we think, okay, well, is it nicely structured, is it nicely formatted, does it fit in well, is there any degree of refactoring that would be needed for it? So we improve our code at that point, make sure that it all nicely fits together, whilst continuing to pass that particular test that we've implemented. So we've got the red, green refactor. And um, having done that, we go on to the next uh, introduced test and repeat the process. So we'll go around and around that particular loop. So just give you a breakdown of this. So we start off, write a test, and that test is to capture new behavior. It'll fail because there's no code, just a test at that point in time. Then generally we write uh, just enough code to have it compile. So if we're introducing new functionality, um, in a lot of cases this will involve us maybe putting in a new component, extending a component, linking two things together, introducing an interface. Uh, so these are in terms of how the components link together. So we, we're doing this first of all, uh, before we start then putting in necessarily sort of code that is going to actually execute or to do something. So write just enough code so that we can compile uh, whatever it is the feature we're going to put in. Uh, so make the structural changes and again we run it against the test and we'll notice the test will still fail that whilst we've got the structure in place we haven't yet put in any uh, logic behind it. We then write just enough code to pass the test and no more than that. Uh, so we introduce the behavior at this point, we can run our unit test, it'll pass uh, this particular point, so then we, we've, done, uh, we've done that so far. And the final phase is we fracture it. We have a look to see, can we improve what we've done? Uh, how does it look? Introduce any refactoring changes. And of course, we'll do this in a way that continues to make sure that the test is passed. Benefits, there's a number of uh, actually quite significant benefits around TDD. So we'll go briefly over them here. Um, it helps uh, both improve your design and improve your implementation. So we'll look at some design reasons on this particular slide. So the first one is gets the developers to clarify the acceptance criteria for the next piece of work. That's important because quite often if you go to a developer with well, we want this piece of functionality, they think, uh, or a lot of people are more inclined to think in terms of, well, how can I introduce that piece of functionality? That's a useful step, but it's not the right, the right first step. The right first step is to think about, well, how will I know when I have introduced that piece of functionality? So to think about what it uh, takes to make it valid, to make it acceptable to the user. So because Test Driven Development puts the emphasis in this first, it then helps remove any uncertainty or raises clarifying questions at an early stage before any of the implementation has happened. And that's the best point, the ideal point to have um, those sorts of discussions and consideration. Second point, encourages more loosely coupled components. Um, the reason for this is because you're introducing simple tests and you're doing just enough code to pass those simple tests that will tend to result in, in sort of nicely, loosely coupled components. You're not going into a situation where the programmer will have a new piece of functionality. In their head, they'll go, right, well, I'll need this component, I'll need that component, so I'll put in both of them, I'll link them together in terms of coupling. So that, that, that type of processing can introduce unnecessary coupling because here we're going for the simplest possible uh, unit test and implementing just enough to pass it uh, we'll generally put in one component, one interface, one piece of functionality at a time. Third point provides an executable description of the code, also known as documentation by example. So in this case here, as opposed to develop a whole bunch of documentation, we create a complete suite of uh, tests that in essence describe precisely how the software works, what it does, how it they sort of handles error conditions and things like this. So it gives us a rich sort of functional description of how the application uh, works. That's quite a useful thing to have. Uh, final bit, discourages the addition of unnecessary features. So because we stop once we've done enough to pass the test, we're not adding in other things that we may not need, which takes time and effort, that may introduce buggy code, 
Um, so we just do enough to pass it. It keeps it lean in terms of the development. In terms of then improving implementation, so other than improving the design, there's some implementational benefits, a few of them here. Requires constant integration and encourages full automation. So if we're going to be using the test-driven development, we have lots of short tests being introduced. So we want to introduce a test, we want to introduce some code. As soon as we save that code, we automatically want the thing to be built and for the functionality of the built code to be run against the set of tests that we have and for us to get a report back on that. You don't want to have the developer having to manually do this. Instead, you want this to be fully automated, continuous integration. So as soon as any new code is saved or committed to it, the whole build and testing process automatically happens and the programmer just gets back the report showing uh, how many tests have been passed. Provides a complete set of regression tests, the second one. So because we're developing this set of tests, it is always there. Any time then that we add or change our functionality and we rerun our tests, we'll rerun all, all of the tests that we have defined. So this basically gives us a way of making sure we don't accidentally introduce some new functionality that breaks some other previous tests. We'll discover that very quickly if that's the case. And the final benefit you see at the bottom is permits errors to be detected and more importantly solved uh, when everything's still fresh in your mind. So if I've written a new piece of functionality and I see as soon as I save it and commit the thing, I automatically get back an error report. It'll be fresh in my mind as opposed to me producing something uh, and then on maybe one week down the line, submitting the thing in to be fully tested and discovering at that point, oh, there are some bugs. So this helps smooth the process out. So we test as close as we can to the point where we've implemented uh, the actual code. So lots of significant benefits. There are some challenges associated with test-driven development. So we'll go through them here. And the first one's a very practical requirement that at least until it's been established as, as a habit, uh, test-driven development requires real discipline uh, to go to people, to go to programmers and to say, look, you're going to have to go through this process. It maybe hasn't been a way you've done before. And I know most programmers want to get into the code to start creating the functionality. But this is saying, no, you must adhere to these rules and to do a test, just do enough to pass it and keep on repeating that process. So it's, um, it can be a challenging thing for developers to, to, to want to code in that particular way until they've tried it consistently for a bit and have been able to see the advantages of actually operating in that particular uh, manner. Uh, and the, the other difficulty or challenge with test-driven development, again, these are all human factors, is that if I say we want to have this certain piece of functionality, uh, most developers you immediately think in your head, well, I could implement it this way or that type of algorithm might be needed or this design pattern is going to be needed. So we jump very, very quickly to possible ways of implementing it. And that's a dangerous thing to do because we're almost deciding the design at that particular point. Instead, test-driven development, if we're going to do it properly, when given a new piece of functionality, we've got to have the discipline to think of, well, what exactly or what precisely do I need to be able to show and to show well for me to prove that this is, has been passed, has been implemented. To think cleanly about the tests and then from that to let the natural design emerge that will help satisfy those particular tests. So a couple of challenges. Uh, overall then, in terms of test-driven development, um, if you do write tests, first of all, it is a good way. There's lots of strong benefits actually uh, in terms of then helping you, in terms of your design, in terms of your implementation. So test-driven development is a good approach to use, a good philosophy to use, but it's also a challenging approach and will require discipline to learn at uh, a start. But it's certainly worthwhile putting in that time and effort to, to master this particular technique.